We've got some basketball. Hey there, Duke fans. Welcome to episode 255 of the Duke Basketball Report podcast. So excited to join you as the season has begun and the Blue Devils actually played a game. Don't know how many more they're going to play, but they at least played one. Um, we're going to be recapping that. We're going to be looking ahead to a big time opponent coming up in just a couple days. Before we do any of that, time for introductions. I am Jason Evans, your host this week. I am, as always, doin joined, joined, I'm joined. <laughs> I'm joined by Donald and Sam. Donald, how's it going this morning? You excited to be talking some hoops? Yeah, and as we were talking about in the last show and, and between the last show and this one, we were very close to not having some basketball to discuss on this episode as well. So I'm really glad that we finally got on the court. We did everything safely and we got the W. There you go. Sam, how about you? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I can't believe this day is here. And the game was weird to watch, but we do get to talk about it and just break down basketball plays. Yeah, and one thing I want to add, um, I'll let you guys talk a lot about the game, but, but uh, I, I'm going to add in at some point later on, folks. I, I got to participate in the post-game press conference with Coach K, and he addressed some of the weirdness that Sam was just talking about about this game. Duke beats Coppin State 81-71, to probably not the at score that everyone expected because, you know, Duke was a 35-plus point favorite in this game. We only win by 10 points, and, and let's face it, it was a two-possession game at various points down the stretch. It wasn't like this was a very easy, easy victory for the Blue Devils. Sam, I'm going to come to you first. I, you know, I, I, I want to let, – let's put aside for a moment – we will get to the incredible performances by some of the players because there are a couple guys especially who were truly impressive in this game. Let's talk about just from a team standpoint – uh, you know, obviously the turnovers have to concern you a lot. What, what, what you're feeling about how Duke performed as a team, that comes first, and then we're going to get to the fabulous debut of Jalen Johnson. I talked about turnover margin being one of the things I'm going to watch this season. You mentioned, yes, you Jason, did. that the, yeah, yes, you did. The, score, the final score of this game is not the score we expected. We, we don't think that Duke should be beating a sub-300 presumably Ken Palm team by only 10 points, regardless of location. This game could be at Coppin State and Duke should be winning by 20 plus. I think you got a zero in immediately at Duke turning the ball over 22 times and only forcing eight Coppin State turnovers. The defense needs to be a lot crisper on, on the perimeter for the Blue Devils. They, they should have been, I know that Coppin State has a lot of these quick guards and a couple of guys who can make shots, but Duke should have been disrupting the passing lane a lot better than they did in this game. And then I think that there's a combination of freshman jitters, unfamiliarity with the, with the setup as much as they've played in empty Cameron indoor, they haven't played in empty Cameron indoor against yellow jerseys or any other colored jerseys other than white and blue yet. So there's a lot of unfamiliarity with the team in, in this scenario. That being said, 22 is too many turnovers and especially in a game where Duke was really relying on, they went right to the, the late season rotation. There were only seven guys that played that played big minutes here. I know we'll talk a little bit about how size was a factor in that Coppin state didn't have any big men and they really wanted to push the pace. So Duke wasn't able to play some of the big men. We, we expected, we expect this season that guys like Mark Williams and Henry Coleman are going to get 8, 10, 12, 15 minutes a game, maybe. They weren't able to do that in this game. So the rotation was a little weird for Duke. But the discomfort with the, with the ball, I think, was really concerning. I think there's also something interesting to the fact that Joey Baker started this game. We talked in the preseason how we heard from the coaches that the starting lineup was going to include Jeremy Roach, and then it didn't in this game. And Joey Baker was the starter. The point guard duties are kind of weird with with Roach not being in there because it's sort of a shared process between Wendell Moore and, and more so Jordan Goldwire. That part I think needs to get ironed out. So you can tell just overall that there's a level of discomfort in this game that the Duke exhibited. They're going to have to clean up a lot of that before they play Michigan state this week. So I, I don't, I'm not trying to say that everything that you just said wasn't true, but I do want to add a little bit of realism into this for the people out there that this was our first basketball game in 266 days. I was expecting it to be a little sloppy. Was I expecting 22 turnovers? Absolutely not. I don't think any of us were doing that. And Coach K in the press conference mentioned that when he said that Coppin State was not a pressure defense type of, of team. They were a team that kind of 
gives you a defense and you can you can attack it. And he was kind of surprised at the fact that we yeah, didn't they, attack they, it. The they way pack they it in a little bit. They're not attacking yeah. you on the perimeter. They're packing it in and forcing you to take jump shots over them. Right. So he's that a, trap, but that shouldn't be a turnover prone process. Yeah. The, he mentioned a lot of those turnovers were unforced and I, and I agree with him, but I do think that the sloppiness is, is generated by the fact that we haven't played in 10 months. And I think these guys, you know, it's just like the, the, the preseason games, the preseason games that we usually have are usually really sloppy. We play some team that we end up beating by 30, but we play some team that is, if they were, if they were in the Ken Palm ranking, they they would be off the rankings. They would be that low. So we have a chance to work out some of these, uh, these mishaps before the season starts, because usually when we start the season, we start with someone like our next opponent, Michigan state. And Coppin state is not, I said, they're not talented, but they are coached by former Duke rival Juan Dixon. I hope everybody noticed that he was on the sideline. They, they highlighted him during the broadcast. I also noted that William Avery was one of the broadcasters in this game. Which yeah, I had, I had, I don't know if we want to talk too much about that because calling for he was, calling from a, a remote location because they weren't in Cameron. Uh, yeah, he was night. he was a little uh, he, he was a little raw in his in his commentary. Not that not that we not a lot of depth. talk, not but a lot of depth there. It's yeah. every it's the, everyone 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 was uh, was in their preseason mode last night. It's the fine. point <laughs> being the point being that Juan Dixon is the coach for Coppin State, and if you want to talk about discipline. And, and former Duke opponents. I mean, can you imagine or can you remember a Duke opponent that was more disciplined than the backcourt of Juan Dixon and Steve Blake when they played for Maryland in the early 2000s? I will say that Juan Dixon, at least, you know, uh, Jason, you could go, go back to even your days. I think Juan Dixon is probably the most well-respected opponent that we've had in a Duke uniform. He's Everyone up there respected. for sure. He's up, yeah, if, if he's not one, he's two. But that So you so- knew... You, you knew, knew what then. kind of defense, you knew what kind of intensity, you knew what kind of energy. And if you notice in the under four timeout, we replaced three of the starters after the under, I'm sending out the under four, the under 16 timeout, that very first TV timeout. Coach K was not pleased with the energy. So we brought in some guys that kind of got that energy back a little bit. He brought in uh, Mark Williams. He brought in Jeremy Roach. He brought in, brought in DJ Stewart. Then after a minute, he brought in, Henry Coleman, who was only in for a minute, that minute, but that energy is what he needed. Uh, Coach K needed to get everything back on track. So the, the sloppy early, sloppy throughout the game, really. Energy was lacking, in, and those were things that we have worried about all preseason because we knew that they were walking into a new environment in Cameron where there's no fans, and they have to generate that intensity. That intensity wasn't there. Juan Dixon was a guy that always brought that energy, and he has obviously instilled that in Compton State because they had energy throughout the game. Look, Coach K said in the post-game press conference, Coppin State is a more experienced team than Duke. Uh, they have a lot of seniors. They've got a lot of juniors. They've got a lot of transfers and JUCOs and players like that who have been around college basketball in some form for a while. And Coach K said, you know, it was men playing against boys. Uh, by the way, when we get to the Michigan State preview, we're going to be talking about that as well. Again, it's going to be men playing against boys, and that puts Duke at a disadvantage. But I I want to focus in just really quickly on our most experienced players. Jordan Goldwire, Joey Baker, Wendell Moore, and Matthew Hurt are the guys who have played a lot of minutes for Duke in the past, played a lot last year. And I'll just go ahead and say it. I'm not sure any one of those four guys had a good game yesterday. Um, In fact, I'm pretty sure none of them had a good game. Um, they were the ones, they were committed a lot of turnovers. There were several turnovers that were credited to other players that I think were, were the fault of poor passes or poor decisions by some of those guys. Um, Duke was saved by, by the play of Jamin Brakefield and DJ Stewart. I mean, there's absolutely no question about that. So here we have a team where we thought we were going to have more experience than usual. We started a very experienced lineup. And it was the young guys who saved us. Jamin, uh, Jamin Brakefield, by the way, I thought played some really key minutes in the second half, brought a lot of energy. Donald, you're talking about energy. I thought Mark Williams had good energy when he played. Did not, neither one of them played very much. They only played about four minutes each, but had an impact when they were in there. But the real story of this game has to be DJ Stewart and Jalen Johnson. Incredibly impressive ball players. I, I, I want to get to Jalen Johnson, first of all. About two minutes into this game, I think I sent the note to you guys. I sent a note to a bunch of my friends. We were two and a half minutes into the game, and I said, okay, I'm already abundantly clear that Jalen Johnson is the best player to Duke uniform this season. That was a sentiment 
reverberating around Twitter after that under 14 <laughs> mile. They're like, well, we know who the best player on this team is this year. It's Jalen Johnson. Yeah, I think it was and, the blocks. I, I think the blocks put him over the, the – like, it's one thing to, to make all the shots, and he's not going to have those, those 100% from the field nights every night, but the blocks were like, oh, okay, this, 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 this dude's got some moves. Yeah. The, to me, the most impressive thing, the blocks were amazing. His ability just to be around the ball. I mean, 19 rebounds. He, he set a freshman record for defensive rebounds. He, I think it was 15 defensive rebounds that he had, uh, which, which Duke said is a freshman record for Duke. I, I mean, that's, that is a really, really impressive. 19 rebounds. 19 rebounds, 19 points in your freshman debut. Uh, look, at, I don't know that it was what Zion Williamson did against Kentucky, but, but it's up there. It's one of the most impressive freshman performances we've ever seen. And DJ Stewart was almost as good. I mean, I almost feel bad for DJ that, that, we had, that we're all raving about Jalen Johnson because ordinarily, dude comes, out, comes off the bench to hit 10 out of 18 shots, score 24 points. By the way, DJ Stewart, little tiny slight DJ Stewart, not a big guy, <laughs> had nine rebounds. He's one of these other guys. Both of them, it feels like, when the ball is like no one's ball, it's their ball. That They have a nose for the ball that is really impressive. They lead the team in scoring one and two. They lead the team in rebounding one and two. Really impressive freshman, uh, you know, debuts. Yeah, I, I, when it comes to Jalen Johnson, it's not just, as Sam said, it's not just the points. It's not just the rebounds. It was everything. He, he had 19 and 19. He had five assists. He had four blocks. He felt, it felt like he was in every facet of the game for the first 10 minutes of the game he almost had a double double before the under four timeout in the first half like the dude was everywhere uh he he was listed as seven turnovers but as sam mentioned and i think jason as you mentioned a lot of those turnovers weren't necessarily his they were people who uh passed the ball into him trying to get him into the action and passed it into you know a triple team and it was stolen from him uh, so it wasn't necessarily where he made something uh, something careless that led to it. But uh, I do think when it comes to Jalen Johnson, it, his game was up here. It was at another level as opposed to everyone else on the floor, including our guys. And uh, it's one of those things where we've been talking about preseason. Oh, they really haven't talked much about him. I told you they were going to let the beast out of the cage right when the season started. And he, and he took full advantage of that. So did DJ Stewart, by the way, he had a tremendous game off the bench 24 points leading all scores off the bench is a really uh, difficult thing to do, but he inserted himself into the game. He was very active. He was very, uh, he was just aggressive on everything on offense and defense. And I think that's what you want to see from our guys. On Johnson, I, this is obviously an overperformance from him, unless he is just a wildly <laughs> like more <laughs> impactful player than we expected. That, I think, comes from Coppin being a smaller team where Jalen Johnson can effectively play center as, you know, he was he was making defensive plays around the rim last night and making it look pretty easy, you know, relatively speaking. We're not going to see that every night. We're not going to see that from him, I think, against Michigan State, which has a lot more size and a lot more experience. Johnson looked like like a man relative to some of these Coppin State players, which is impressive given his age. On Stewart, I am impressed with the way that he was able to, to come in and make an impact. You guys, Jason was talking about how Stewart was able to, to pull down so many rebounds and he's not that big of a guy. That is, that's a huge development for Duke. And I mentioned the starting lineup and, and how Joey Baker was in there when we all expected Jeremy Roach to be in. You may find if if DJ Stewart is going to have this much of an impact and bring this much energy that he might get more starts at which we all collectively did not expect during the, the stats preview, DJ Stewart could get more starts on account of his scoring and his energy being more important perhaps than Jeremy Roach's point guard skills. And that's something to watch going forward. Yeah. Can we go back to the stats game? I'd like to revise my DJ Stewart st uh, starts. <laughs> Look, I'd like he, it, it might, it might make more sense for him to come off the bench, but if he is this good, then he has to start. Uh, it, it might, but let me, let me ask you this question. If I gave you 20 as an over under on DJ Stewart starts, would you take the over or the under? I think I would still take the under, but it's more than 10 now. One and, one and is, we had what three four before and, yeah. and I'm I, I think he's got to start 
I mean, if he's this good, again, this is one sample against not a great opponent. But I, I think he's he's proven that he's one of the five or six best players on the team. So yes, he should get more starts and and matchup dependent. He might be the most important player for Duke on a given night. One is not a good enough, big enough sample size uh, number of games. One being uh, is not enough for me to be like, yeah, he's definitely getting over twenty at this point. Especially when with that one sample size, he did not start. So uh, just just sheer just throwing some mathematics into it and some stats. I think, yes, is going to be probably higher than what we all thought, but 20 seems high at this point. I'm willing to wait, wait it out and see. So the only thing I would say is that Coach K likes to play his best players, and he tends to start his best. Co- Coach K doesn't have a history of, oh, let's, let's have this guy come off the bench, even though I know he's one of my five best. If you're one of, your five, of his five best, he tends to start you, and so that's why I think DJ Stewart's going to start a lot because he certainly looked like one of Duke's five best players. I, I, Donald, I think you're absolutely right. Do not, do not overreact too much to one game. I want everyone to remember that Shavlik Randolph looked like a future NBA Hall of Famer after his first couple games in a Duke uniform. Love you, Shav, but uh, that didn't quite work out for him. So things can happen. Things can change. I, I, I want just a couple other really quick notes. First of all, I, you know, we talked a lot about uh, Jalen Johnson and, and the rebounding and the shot blocking. He made all his shots. I think the most impressive thing to me was the way he would rebound and get out, get out and transition. We heard a lot of talk about he's a really good passer, and he had some great passes. He had some passes that also ended up in the crowd. <laughs> he's going to have to work on that. But the, the ability of this guy to grab a rebound and begin moving up the court, you know, sort of create his own fast break is a real weapon for Duke. And I want folks to keep an eye on that as we move forward. So that's one note I had. Uh, another note about Jalen Johnson, uh, guys, can, can we just for a moment, that one-handed twisting tap rebound in the second half, I, I think that might have been one of the most athletic things I've seen a Duke player do since Zion Williamson blocked DeAndre Hunter's three-point shot at UVA. Uh, agree, disagree? What do y'all think? I, I, I liked it. I, I thought it was cool. It was very acrobatic. It was very good. Uh, I, I'm not going to – because, you know, we've seen some guys dunk stuff like that. And I'm not saying that he could – that he should have dunked it. He did exactly what he was supposed to. Uh, but I think it gets elevated when you throw it down a little bit more. But the, just the sheer acrobaticness of, of it, is great. And I just want to mention about Jalen Johnson real quick. Jalen Johnson was not a top 10 recruit. I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there. Someone messed up because this man is a top 10 recruit. Well, we can explain that. It was because his senior season was very interrupted by injury, his senior high school season, interrupted by injury. And there was some other weird stuff. He was transferring around to different schools, trying to find the right fit. And, and as a result, I think he sort of fell out of the recruiting gurus, fell under their radar to some extent, if, if a guy who's a top five recruit can. I said what I said. Jalen Johnson is a top 10 recruit. I don't care what happened last year. <laughs> I agree. I agree. I, I, uh, so, so guys, let me wrap it up with a couple other little things. Um, you guys mentioned free throw shooting that Duke only had um, 10 free throws, which, which is crazy. And by the way, of our 10 free throws, at least four of those free throws came on two on one fast breaks where we got fouled, where taking free throws is actually sort of a bad outcome. It was, you know, plays where you expected Duke to get dunks, um, and, and, you know, ex- get, get themselves excited. And, and instead we got free throws out of it. So the free throws have got to be better. You guys know I'm obsessed with field goal attempts. I, I think, you know, it's a great reflection of the turnovers and, and a lot of other stats uh, that, that get factored into field goal attempts. Coach K in the postgame press conference talked about the fact that, that we had so many turnovers. We had possessions that did not end with us taking a shot. That is field goal attempts. We got out field goal attempted by six. That's, that's a bad sign. We have got to get that under control. And then the last thing I want to talk about that Coach K said that I thought this was really, really smart. He was asked about not having fans in Cameron. And he said, it's tough to explain, but with no atmosphere, you can get stuck in your own head. He said, you know, sometimes these guys do something and they go, oh, why did I do that? What am I doing? This is not me. When there's a crowd there, he said, the crowd can lift you up. The crowd sort of distracts you from getting too stuck in your own head. He said he really thinks some of his guys got stuck and there wasn't a crowd, whether, whether your own crowd or a rival crowd, there wasn't that other element to sort of take you away from getting 
stuck in your own thoughts and he thought it impacted the team. I thought that was a really interesting comment from Coach K uh, about this game and, and what we saw. And it's something we're going to have to deal with. The guys are going to have to adjust to this because they ain't going to be playing in front of fans anytime soon. Yeah, and one final note on the lineup. The lineup is listed with Jordan Goldwire as the only guard. Uh, the other four guys were listed as forwards. So it's interesting that they did that, especially when we've been considering the fact that Wendell Moore or, or maybe even Joey Baker would be listed kind of as a guard in this lineup. Uh, so that also leads me to believe that next game, if we're, you know, when we're playing against Michigan State, we're going to be playing against a couple of pretty good guards and a couple of, and some big guys. We're going to have some guards in this lineup, which means that this starting five will likely change. And speaking of Michigan State, that is who we're going to be talking about next. But before that, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back on the DBR podcast in just one moment. All right, so we're back, and we need to talk about what is up next for the Blue Devils because it is a major, major opponent. It is Michigan State. Um, a team like Duke that is, you know, highly ranked, highly regarded, and uh, a team coming off an impressive victory. They, they just beat Notre Dame. So, um, Sam, I'll go to you first on Michigan State. Tell me a little bit about what to expect from the Spartans. Seems like we play these guys every single year. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's amazing. Duke-Michigan State might as well be a conference game, you know? <laughs> it, it, it is that way, and given that you know, most guys don't stay in college through their senior seasons and Duke has played Michigan state each of the last two years. I can actually go back and, and preview this game a lot on the Michigan state side by looking at some of their players and, and, and how they've performed against Duke the last couple of years. Obviously it's not going to carry over perfectly. The Duke lineup changes a lot year to year and the Michigan state players seem to mature a lot because hello, their coach is Tom Izzo, one of the very best coaches in college basketball sidelined for a little bit of this preseason due to coronavirus. But you can expect that a team coached by Tom Izzo is always going to come out prepared and ready. This team is experienced. So they lose two of their best players from last season, Cassius Winston and Xavier Tillman, but they've got a whole host of guys back behind them. Aaron Henry seems like he's the the leader, best player on this team so far in this young season. He's a junior forward. You guys will probably remember him from uh, from Duke's recent battles with Michigan State. I think that the most interesting thing about Aaron Henry is to think about who's going to be guarding him. He's a six, six forward. So he's not the biggest guy. I think you might expect Wendell Moore to be on him for a little bit, but depending on the size of Duke's lineup, you might want to have one of the bigger guys on him. Henry is, is pretty dynamic. They've also got a, a number of other key players. Josh Lankford is back with this team. He was out last season due to an injury, but he is, um, but he's been, he's been very effective so far for Michigan State, and they expect a lot out of him. Another guy who's important for them is, is uh, transfer Joey Hauser, who played for Wojo at Marquette his freshman season, averaged 10 and 5 before transferring to Michigan State, and he's averaging a double-double to begin the season. And when you go down through the roster, it's a lot of guys who look like that, this like 6'6 to 6'9 dynamic forwards, the kind of dudes that we're going to need to see more out of we were talking about the, the, the Duke forwards, guys like Henry Coleman are going to have to step up more in this game probably because Michigan State brings a lot more size than, um, than does Coppin State, obviously. It's Michigan State. Yeah, and, and I was going to say, my, my big thing is that they are, to some extent, Michigan State is the opposite of the current hoop trend, which is teams playing three and four guard lineups. I mean, Coach K even said that he thought that Coppin State played a five guard lineup at times. Michigan State really only has three guards who play. Now, their guards are, are good, make no mistake, but they really only have three guards who play at all. They don't tend to play together, those three guards. They tend to play a ton of forwards. You mentioned some of the names. I want to mention a few other the burly guys. Thomas Kithier, uh, Marcus Bingham Jr. Uh, you already mentioned uh, Joey Hauser. Uh, th these are these are beefy players. These are guys who are going to bang with you, and it should come as no surprise. Michigan State is a really good rebounding team. I feel like you could say that any year for the past twenty years. Tom Izzo is your coach. You're going to be a good rebounding team. They they out rebounded um, both of their first two opponents. Notre Dame they out rebounded by twelve. Eastern Michigan they out rebounded by eight. 
They are also a shot blocking machine. They had five shot blocks against Eastern Michigan. They blocked 12 shots, 12 shots against Notre Dame. A good way to keep a team from putting the ball in the basket is to block it before it gets to the basket. And Michigan State is great at that. And Sam, I want to highlight the other thing that you said. This is a this is men playing against Duke's boys. They have a couple sophomores who play a little bit, but all the rest of their guys are juniors and seniors. That this is a very, very experienced team. You mentioned that they don't have many guards, but the guards they do have are very effective between Foster Lawyer and their arguably their best defender is Rocket Watts, who's the smallest player on the team, but who is able to bottle up uh, opposing guards. So you are going to see Rocket Watts guarding, I assume, DJ Stewart for, for big stretches of the game. He also comes off the bench. And you might see him on, on Wendell Moore if Wendell Moore gets it going. So keep an eye on Michigan State's guards because those guys are, are pretty good perimeter defenders physicality every year we play Michigan State that is the key to the game every single time it was just like last year we come off of the Stephen F. Austin loss and we're like yo we have to be physical against Michigan State and we did that we did that against at Michigan State at Virginia Tech it set the tone for you know a nice little run through the middle of the season for us but when it comes to Michigan State it is always about physicality you mentioned the rebounding that's one thing we had 50 rebounds last night but 19 of them were Jalen Johnson which means everyone else has to really step up the other thing, the blocks, that means we have to go up and go strong. The, fr- the, the free throw battle that we have, you know, we only had 10 last night. That needs to go up because that means, A, we're going to the foul line. We're being aggressive. B, is putting these guys, especially their big men, into foul trouble. And we're going to get – I mean, they're playing – they played nine guys uh, the other night that had more than 10 minutes on uh, during uh, – against Notre Dame. So, you have to be physical with these guys. You have to match that because – the energy level, we, we keep saying that word energy, they always bring it. They always bring that intensity every single time because Izzo will eat you if you, if you, don't, if you play for Michigan State and don't bring energy. So those are the two things I'm looking for on Tuesday night. We talked at the beginning of this episode about turnovers being maybe the most concerning thing for Duke, giving up 22 to Coppin State. Michigan State turned the ball over 18 times against Eastern Michigan and then 12 times against Notre Dame. 12 is not bad it's not great, but it's not bad. If Michigan state is kind of sloppy with the ball, then that could be an interesting element to this game with, with the ball going kind of back and forth without a lot of made shots or even shots taken. Guys, can I, can I ask, do you expect Duke to win this game? We don't usually get into predictions and the such. I will openly say because of their experience, um, I I think Michigan state would be the favorite in this game. What, What do y'all think? I think prior to the season, it would be easy to look at Michigan State's team and say, we don't know who's going to step up. We don't know who the stars are going to be. Sort of like when we look at Duke's team before this season. But they've had, they've had two strong, not overwhelming victories where it's clear that, that there are a number of guys on the team that are, that are ready to be, you know, to, to, to be leaders. Aaron Henry being, I think, chief among, th- among them. So if you had asked me a couple of weeks ago, I would say, yeah, why not? None of these guys have been, have been the, the key to Michigan State's team. Having seen them in these first two games, I would say, I think Michigan State's going to win. I don't think it's going to be an out-of-control victory. I, I would, if, you, if you really needed me to guess, it'd be something in the three to five point range. I always expect this and predict for us to win every single game. I, it's not a homer thing. It's just that I think our team on paper and on the court is better than almost every other team that we've ever faced since we started the podcast. That is no different against Michigan State. It's personal for me. I don't like Michigan State. I was about to Michigan say, I, 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 can't, I can't believe this with a straight <laughs> it, face coming from Donald talking it, about Michigan State. <laughs> and, and at the same time, uh, my birthday is on Monday, so it will be a nice late birthday present. I, I mean, you gave me a little bit dude, uh, uh, yesterday. But to cap it off, get me one against Michigan State. Always against Michigan State. I, I will say, w- regardless of the, of the outcome, I think this is a great opponent for Duke to be playing early in the season because a lot of the things Michigan State does well are things that Duke aspires to do well. And it will be great for this team to go up against a Michigan State team that has a lot of dynamic forwards, that, that has a lot of guys who are not the star. We saw in the first game that maybe Jalen Johnson is the star of this Duke team, but there will be more nights than not where it's hard to peg who the star is for Duke. Some nights it'll be Matthew Hurt. It'll be Wendell Moore. It may be Jordan Goldwire. It may be DJ Stewart. We, we, we saw that the other night. It may even be guys farther down the bench like Henry Coleman or Mark Williams. That is what Michigan State does well. 
Last thing I want to add, because I know folks during the game at some point will go, hey, wait a second, is that Michigan State has two guys who have a last name you will recognize deep on their bench. Jack Hoiberg and Stephen Izzo should come as no surprise that Stephen Izzo is Tom Izzo's son. Jack Hoiberg, in case you're wondering, yes, he is the son of Fred Hoiberg, former college basketball coach, former pro basketball coach. Uh, so Michigan State trying to corner the market on sons of coaches. They did not nepotism, get but, yeah. nepotism not only present on the Duke roster in this game. <laughs> Right, right. A little, a Savarino, yes, a, a descendant of Coach K. Um, and by the way, I, I want to add um, real quick tip of the hat. It appears that Syracuse's best player early in the season is Buddy Beheim, son of Jim Beheim. Jim Beheim, too old to have a son in college? We investigate. <laughs> Okay, guys, uh, we're, we're kind of getting close to wrapping things up, but we got to talk a little bit of football. Uh, oh, boy. Football team loses to Georgia Tech 56 to 33. That's a crazy score, by the way. That's just a weird, weird number. 56 to 33. That may be a scoregami or something like that. Uh, it, it was a close game. Uh, Duke made it 35 to 33 late in the third quarter. Looked like, you know, the, the Devils were going to really – make it a, a good contest, but it was all Georgia Tech the rest of the way. They, uh, they absolutely destroyed the Duke defense. Tech rushed for almost 400 yards. Didn't matter who was rushing the ball. Their starting running back, running back was killing us, and he got hurt in the second quarter, and their backup running backs killed us as well. Uh, it, 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 was not, it was not pretty. They, they, they could do whatever they wanted on the ground, and uh, the story was, once again, Duke's terrible turnovers. Ugh. Donald, let me go to you. Uh, what, what's going on with our football team? I just want to take you back to just how the state of the season has gone. I'm going to take you to the second quarter. Jay, uh, Jason, I know what you, you're, you know what I'm talking about here. Uh, so Duke punts the ball because our offense was inefficient. Happens a lot. Kicks the ball. And there's a booming punt inside the 10. The Georgia Tech punt returner muffs it into the end zone. We recover it for a touchdown. We're like, yo, this is great. Awesome. Uh, think, wait, wait, by the way, think about that. Uh, that is a rare play to get. Yeah. Like, the, it wasn't the guy was hit. The guy just muffed it. The guy just muffed it into yeah. the end zone. Like, he was standing on his five. It's a he, gift he, touchdown. He, an absolute yeah, he, gift. So then, after the touchdown that we have, we kick off to them. The, it, we stop them. We get them inside the one. No, no. Actually, because, because, a guy, yeah. because the guy decided he was going to do what is a rare play, but is a, a, a rare feel uh, – a, a rare rule that happens where if you catch the ball out of bounds, then it's considered a kick out of bounds. He tried to do that, except he did what every receiver does. He dragged his foot as he caught the ball in bounds. So he was determined to have caught the ball in bounds at the four yard line. We then stuffed them back to, they have a, they have a penalty, a holding penalty that backs them up half the distance. So they're inside the two now. And then we stopped them in the end zone for a safety. Okay. We have the safety. Then on the kickoff, Phil Yaw Johnson decides that he's not going to fair catch it. It rolls down to the one-yard line. He then picks up the ball, not before signaling for a fair catch. I think all of you out there realize that if, you, if the ball hits the ground, you cannot fair catch it. It is, at that point, a live ball. He picks up the ball and stops, then realizes, oh, crap, I can't call fair catch on this. But at that point, he swarmed at the one. We have one play where we try to get out of the end, try to push it further down. We get to like the one and a half yard line. And then the very next play, we fumble the ball in the end zone. Just uh, Chase Price gets absolutely destroyed and they recover for a touchdown. And that was in the span of like a minute and a half real time. It was, it was just one of the wildest things that I've seen in college football this year. And that is saying a lot because college football has had some pretty dumb plays in uh, this year, especially, but this whole thing kind of summed up our season. When we can't get right coming out of the end zone, we can't get right on plays that should be benefiting us. You can't, you can't really expect the rest of the season to go the way it is. And, and again, I'll end with this. Turnovers. There were so many turnovers on this team. Like I thought apples were playing because there was just turnovers all over the place. And you can't win if you don't hang on to the football. It's been our story all season long. Look, I want to be clear. I want to recap what Donald just spoke about. Duke lost this game big. I mean, we got blown out in a game in which we got a safety. We turned a muffed punt into a touchdown. 
we, 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 you didn't mention it, but we converted a fake punt for a first down and we still lost to a bad team. This Georgia Tech team is not a good team. And it's because we committed five turnovers. But think about that. You got a safety, a muffed punt for a touchdown. You converted a, a fake punt first down and you still got blown out. May, mind you, Georgia Ugh. Tech had not played since Halloween because of the bye and a couple of games that were removed because of COVID, namely one against uh, Miami. The last game they played was against Notre Dame and they got mollywopped. Our last game was that game that we got mollywopped against UNC back on November 7th. We had a bye and then the weight game was canceled and now we are playing. So it was two teams who had not played in a month and that football was present on the field last night. It felt like these guys had forgot to play the game. I don't need to pile on too much, but Duke had more turnovers this week than I had slices of pie. And I think that's a, that's a big stat. <laughs> same, same you, for hey, me. You, you need to up your pie game. I think, <laughs> I've had, I think I've had three slices of pie. I've I've been good. It, might, it only, might be four. I only had one, but I had a lot of food. I mean, when you have a lot of food, there's no room for dessert. That's really the issue. That's the problem. Yeah. My, my mom made a corn casserole that like was out of this world. My, my mom, by the way, shout out to my mother. There were five of us for Thanksgiving, me, my wife, my kids, and my mom. And my mom was actually fairly socially distant from us, even though she's been part of our bubble. My mom made enough food for 20 people. We, we will be eating the Thanksgiving leftovers well into December. And uh, she made a corn casserole. I, we're still talking about it. I, I have not had as much pie as I usually would because that corn casserole is like a dessert. To, to, end, to end the football talk, uh, since we're talking about food, uh, I will say that our last game of the season is supposed to be next weekend against Florida State. Uh, mind you, the team that we were supposed to play last week, Wake, had another game canceled this week, or next week. Next weekend, they were going to play Miami. And the school, uh, Miami, is now searching for an opponent because right now they will have gone almost a month and a half without playing a football game because of their COVID problems. And now Wake has a COVID problem because they canceled our game last week because of problems with them. I will say also very quickly that uh, last night we had one guy that was in the COVID protocol. It's the first player that has been in the COVID protocol for Duke in any sport since August. I will say that I, I hope that he's feeling wet better. It, they didn't mind you say it was a positive test. That can also mean a close contact. That is what Duke's protocol entails. It's kind of like the NFL. So I will say, uh, if that is the case, if he, if he is sick, I hope he's feeling better. I hope, you know, all, all is going well with that player. But I, I will say just the fact that it took from August to late November for us to have one COVID protocol person within the program and within all of Duke athletics, we're, we're still okay. Uh, and it, it didn't affect, I don't think that affected the game, but it was something that, uh, that he didn't make the trip to, uh, to, to Atlanta because of that. Uh, and I think, you know, hopefully they're doing okay and everything's all right for the rest of the game. By the way, Donald mentioned searching for an opponent. I just have to throw this in here. We're about to wrap things up folks, but one of the greatest tweets of all time, Mike Bray, the Notre Dame head coach, Mike Bray actually tweeted and he said, hey, we're looking for a game, uh, hit me up, you know, DM me if you want to play Notre Dame basketball. I can't believe that Mike Bray went on Twitter to say, anyone out there want to play some basketball? And, and he that said, is how we'll, insane. That's how crazy things are right now. And he said, we'll come to you. He said, we'll, we'll come to you safely. Not like, hey, come, someone come to Notre Dame and play. He said, we'll come to you. Like, where are you, where are you guys at? Oh, you're, you're, you're Wyoming? Cool, we'll play you. See you there. So, yeah, that's kind of funny. I, I'm not sure that's the smartest um, way of doing your schedule. I, I think caution is probably a smart thing to be doing right now during these insane times, but Mike Bray wanted to play someone. So he's out there looking on Twitter. It isn't crazy if it works. Amen. Amen to that. So guys, we'll wrap things up very, very quickly. I don't think this will take very long. We have to do player of the week, which is really just player of the game. We only played one game this week. I don't think it is a tough call. Love you, DJ Stewart, but I think I know where we're all going to be going with our votes. Sam, I'll go to you first. Who's your player of the week this week? 19 points, 19 rebounds, one of the most impressive debuts by a freshman we've ever seen, Jalen Johnson. Welcome to player of the week. Donald, what you say, my friend? Uh, I'm going to throw some love to DJ Stewart. He did great, but the player of the game was Jalen Johnson. Uh, uh, 
Sam didn't even mention his four block shots. Yes, the player of the game, unquestionably, Jalen Johnson. What an impressive debut. And by the way, he almost pulled a Christian Leitner. He did not miss a single shot. Not, not quite as many shots taken as Christian Leitner did in the famous Kentucky game. But Jalen took 10 shots in this game, eight field goals, two free throws, didn't miss a single one of them. Whew. Way to go, my man. You're the new JJ. Can, can we call him that? Is he allowed to be the new JJ? There's only one JJ. I mean, only he is one. technically a JJ. That's so. true. So that it is fitting. I, I don't think he, he really comps to JJ Redick all that well, but sure. <laughs> on, the, on the next episode, we'll talk about how since the crazes are there, we can't really get the nicknames fully in bloom for some of these players. We'll work on that for the next one. Exactly. I like it. But that's going to wrap it up for us here on the Duke Basketball Report uh, podcast, episode number 255, as always. We invite you, please, like and subscribe. Send us email, dbrpodcast at gmail.com. We want to hear from all of you about what you think about this. Leave us a nice review. Maybe I will read your review on the air or something special like that. But until we read those reviews on the air, until you send us an email, you're going to have to get by with just listening to the three of us yammering along. He is Donald. He is Sam. I am Jason. We'll be back in just a couple days after Duke plays Michigan State. Until then... Here's the Duke fan to take us home.